We are going to look at a session today. I'm calling it Breaking the Cycle of Sin Dash a Samson Story. And uh, I, I am concealed carrying. Uh, I can't teach Samson without having this with me. It's, it's the youth pastor in me. I just. Um, when, whenever we think of Samson, we. we typically in our minds go to that story. He, he grabs the jawbone and starts smacking some fools around. And, and in, in, our, in, in our heads, when we think of Samson, we think of the, the epitome of masculinity and uh, th this huge, bigger-than-life character that, that uh, nothing can stop him, and he's just so... And to an extent, if, if you're like me, you view him almost like the macho man of the Bible. And for me personally, I'm, I'm a nerd. I really am. I, I ain't got no time for, let's study the, the uber prove yourself guy. I, but there was a change of heart that happened in me a couple years ago. I was teaching through the book of Judges with the youth students. And uh, I was going to spend two weeks on Samson because I didn't want to mess around with him. I, I don't care for the guy. Uh, in in my, my mind, it's like, I'm, I'm not trying to prove nothing. I don't think most people are trying to prove anything. Do they really connect with Samson? I mean, yeah, we all want to be him and have the rippling muscles. And the, but there's, in my head, there was a disconnect. Until I started changing the way that I saw him and the storyline. And I ceased seeing somebody who could break all things and saw somebody who was completely broken. And so we're going to look at the story of Samson today more from that angle. Uh, to do that, I do want to uh, have you open up to Judges if you got your Bible and you want to follow along. I'll tell you right now, I'm going to be not reading big blocks, we're just going to be kind of summarizing what's happening in those blocks, but uh, for some of you guys having, having those uh, Bibles open will we'll help you follow along. Uh, Samson happens in uh, Judges chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. So there's, there's four chapters uh, for Samson here. But uh, judges, we do need to kind of put in, in uh, framework what's happening. Otherwise, Samson doesn't really mean much. He's, he's the macho man of the Bible. He's the Jewish Hercules. Let's go ahead and take this story and flush it and move on to better things, like uh, uh, the, the story prior to that of Gideon. But let, let's, instead of flushing it, instead of dismissing him as a macho man, let's put some framework in place. So the book of Judges ends up happening. You've got, uh, you've got Egypt, and the Israelites are freed from Egypt. They go through the wilderness. They get to the Jordan River. Um, and yes, I am fast-forwarding pretty quick through the 40 years. They end up crossing the Jordan River following a guy, Joshua. And that's where all the battles take place. You see uh, Joshua in the Battle of Jericho, and, and uh, they're, they're destroying the enemy. They're taking ground for God. But then all of a sudden, this, this mentality sets in. The mentality sets in of complacency. The mentality sets in of it's not that bad. I told you, Braddock, I was going to reference that. It's not because you said it, but it's in there. <laughs> So the Israelites start, they start thinking, well, the enemy's not that bad, and starts deciding to coexist hand in hand with the ones that are God's direct enemy. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, in, in this section, we, we see through Judges this, this cycle that's, that's the same for really all humanity, they, they are on fire for the Lord. They're, yeah, we, we did it, let's go. They have a couple victories, and then they get comfortable. They get scared, they get complacent, and they start justifying the sin that is around them with the terminology of not that bad to the point where then it becomes them living side by side with not that bad to not that bad ruling over them, and then not that bad becoming evil and destroying them. 
to the point where they are completely uh, subjugated to the enemy, at which point they call out for a savior and God rescues them with a judge. And they are on fire with this judge and God does great things and then they realize, well, the enemy's not that bad. We've got things mostly under control. And the cycle starts over. You see the cycle transpire several times through the book of Judges. And uh, Samson is the final mainline judge in the book of Judges. And uh, th there's, uh, there's some reasons for that, uh, and we'll get to that at the very end. But uh, as we go through Samson, I, I just want to encourage you, look at it through the view of the common man. I'm a nerd. I didn't realize how much I had in common with Samson until God showed me this story again and I, I started seeing the brokenness and pain that Samson carries. You see, we, we all have those hurts and wounds. Some of you guys, whether you talk about it or not, have been wounded by those closest to you. Your friends, your spouse, people in the past, Maybe even your own dad who should have accepted you from the beginning, but you never felt like you were worth enough to meet his, his bar. Maybe it's by your kids. And you start judging your own victory or stature in Christ based on the decisions that your kids have made. I want to tell you right now and take a quick time out. Yes, the brokenness is real, but... But you can't gauge your relationship with Christ and your faithfulness based on somebody else in theirs. Your success and failure isn't dictated by those around you. And we see that in this Samson story as we get started here. But I just want to encourage you guys. Look at uh, the brokenness of Samson. He was born to a lifestyle that he did not choose. Serving a God he was indifferent towards. With a family that mandated things that he didn't like. He had friends who deeply betrayed him. His very own wife, whom he thought he loved. I say he, he wasn't in love with her, he was in lust with her. But the, the woman who he thought he loved betrayed him and sold him out which led him to be marked as an outlaw. He ends up falling into to the, the sin of prostitution and ultimately giving up on love. He, he finds himself betting with, uh, with Delilah, who betrayed him over and over and over to the point where he is finally in chains with his eyes gouged, sitting in front of the masses as they're heckling entertainment, the, the jester in the court. Just going through that makes me hurt because I think of all the times that I've been through similar situations, been the laughing stock, been, been the butt of the jokes, been, been the one cast off as worthless, the one who tried yet failed. I think we've all been there as men. But see, the sin cycle that we see set in in Samson's story, though it is the same cycle that comes to us, the same God is over us, they can break that cycle and break those chains. And we're going to see that. Sin is a cycle that will leave you broken, leave you pain. So if we can find out the keys to breaking that cycle now, we save ourselves not only some of the hurts, but also save ourselves from some of the traps. Um, so the Philistines, not that bad. Well, these, these guys, they, they were bad news. They, they actually, at one point, this uh, troop of bandits, pirates, if you will, they decide that Egypt was the strongest nation in the world. They thought, oh, we can take them. Why not? And so they ended up attacking Egypt at one point. That would be like uh, some little country, uh, Cuba, deciding, well, you know what? We're going to take over the U.S. today and it actually being feasible. That's what the Philistines were. 
And so they came into the promised land, promised to the Israelites by God, and start trying to steal it. Little, one little compromise, one square inch, square foot, one acre at a time, pushing God's people out of the promise with compromise, with the lie that it's not that bad. They had these false gods, one, one of them in particular, this, this statue, and they'd light a fire in it to where the metal would be molten hot. And then they would grab their own children and lay the babies in the hot arms as the babies screaming and being burned alive. They'd rejoice to their God. And the Israelites, well, they're not that bad. And they're not messing with our babies. And I'm not going to get political right here. But very much sounds like modern America. And I'd encourage all of you guys to read through the book of Judges and see what happens when we think, well, we can live our Christianity over here and you can live whatever you want over there. We need to allow it for the sake of fairness. Read the book of Judges and see if you sing the same song. Because what we see is we have a God that is not compromising but we are so quick to compromise everything and give it all away. One little statement of it, it's not that bad. One little chip at a time until we're a pile of broken rubble on the ground. So that's the Philistines. In here we also see the Nazarite vow. Uh, to give you a quick overview of the Nazarite vow that we're going to see, I used to think the Nazarite vow was just you don't cut your hair. There's more to it than that. Uh, yes, the no cutting your hair makes you stand out a little bit back then. It's like in the hippie days, you could identify a hippie on the, on the flowers in the hair. Uh, but in, in uh, the biblical sense, these guys grew out their hair. You knew who a Nazarite was. They also had laws like you can't touch the dead, you can't be in contact or even, even cross paths with the dead or go through these rituals. Uh, you can't drink, uh, drink al alcohol without going through these rituals. And, and these rituals, one of uh, the requirements is you shave your head so everybody, oh, that's the Nazarite that failed to keep his vows to God. And you wore your shame publicly. Well, Samson, in one part of the story, we see him slay a crew with one of these. Now, pop quiz. How do you kill somebody with this without touching the dead? You're holding part of a corpse in your body, holding that jawbone. And that's exactly what we see Samson do time and time again, compromising not just the, uh, obedience, but his additional vows. Yes, he was pledged to be a Nazarite, but I would argue that he was never a Nazarite in his heart. He never gave it to the Lord, and he kept his hair so that nobody would ever see his shame. So let's, let's go through here, and uh, we're going to look at, uh, at this cycle of sin. I'm going to go ahead and pray us before we get started, and I will tell you, I'm going to go fairly quickly through some of these. But God, uh, thank you so much that you give us a story like Samson, that we can see how... Uh, how to break the cycle of sin before it leaves us crushed and broken, before it removes the anointing completely from us. And I just ask God that, uh, that we would be men of valor, not physically, but spiritually inside in our hearts and minds, that we would be men of valor walking out your plan to free the world that's in bondage around us, not compromising one statement of it's not that bad at a time but that we would be drawing close to you so we can show the world what is good rather than what's not that bad. Thank you, God. Amen. So I say you can't, uh, you can't judge the, uh, yourself, failure or success, based on those around you. We see that in uh, chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, it says, Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for nearly 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah. Uh, his name was Manoah. Well, verse 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren, you will have a child, and you will conceive and bear a son. See, this, this couple here, they were a righteous family. Even more proof <coughs> happens later in uh, chapter 13, where they end up, their initial response is, Let's give God a sacrifice because He's blessed us. This was a righteous, God-fearing family. Towards the end, Manoah ends up saying, we shall surely, in verse 22, we shall surely die because we've seen God. 
See, this family had this fear and reverence, but that did not dictate the relationship of their son with God. You see, your relationship with God is your own. Should you live it out? Most definitely. Should you pass on to your kids how they ought to live? Most definitely. But can you force them into obedience? No. And does that dictate whether you are faithful? No, that dictates whether they're being faithful. So those of you fathers who are carrying your children right now and the burden of seeing them where they're at, you be faithful with your walk with Christ and imparting His words to them. How they respond is them. Your success and failure is not determined by the success and failure of your kids. Your righteousness is not determined by those around you in their righteousness or unrighteousness. Your righteousness is determined by your obedience to God's calling for your life. So in chapter 14, we see the sin cycle start up in Samson's life. The first, uh, the first part in this cycle in verse 1 through 3 is questioning this belief in God. So Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. He went and told his father and his mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as a wife. Dad, sound familiar? I will lay on the floor and kick and scream until you give me what you want or what I want. And his parents tried to reason with him. Unfortunately, though, then his parents gave in to his whims. So what we see here is uh, th this interesting statement where he, get her for me, she pleases me well. If you've got an ESV, it says she is right in my eyes, which seems to be the going phrase through the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, for there was no king, is what Judges says. Now, I would argue there was a king. It was a heavenly king that they refused to allow on the thrones of their lives. And so they pretended like there wasn't a king. Here, Samson starts that movement by pretending there is no king. He wants to do what's right in his eyes. So the, it's questioning the belief in God. This is reminiscent of the original sin. He goes to the, to the Philistines to look for what God will not allow him to have. Adam and Eve go to the tree in the middle of the garden to look at the fruit that they cannot have. This, uh, the serpent says, you can become like God. Eve thinks, God must be holding out on me. God must not be good. He must have ill intentions of me not achieving everything that is pleasing to me. We need to believe and know that God is not holding out on us. God is good and just and has a plan for you and he is not holding out on you. He is not withholding to make you miserable. He is withholding only that which will eventually destroy you. He is protecting you like any father worth their salt would protect their children. And so Samson went into the enemy territory. This uh, curiosity to sin easily grows into a marriage with it. He was curious about the sin. Later he walks out hand in hand married to it. That first hit, that first bottle, that first affair, that first flirty conversation, that first compromise, just out of curiosity, ends up leading to more compromises. Because it's not that bad, becomes the hiss of the serpent, while you end up making one compromise after another until you are a compromised man living hand in hand, married to a compromised culture. When we're okay in part with enmity with God, we are giving away the throne of our heart. See, our throne in our heart is a one-seater. And oftentimes we try to make it a two-seater. Well, God, I love you, but I'm still going to have this, uh, this relationship with my significant other. I still want to have sex with her outside of marriage. I I, I'm just looking at porn, God. It's not that bad compared to actually sleeping around. Or I'm, I'm just doing these drugs rather than those drugs. <laughs> they're, they're not that bad. 
And we start making these justifications until we are married with sin. And there's no difference in us with the Philistines other than we should know who we're serving. So the key to breaking the sin cycle is in verse 3 is she pleases me well. The way to break the cycle here of questioning the belief in God, are you doing what's right in your eyes or what's right in hell's? If it's right in your eyes only and it's pleasing to your eyes only and it's not pleasing to the Heavenly Father, run from it. Push away from what is evil. Don't dabble in it. Run from evil. Flee from evil and run to what is good and embrace that. Take every thought captive and run with that which is of God and pleasing to Him. So number two here in our sin cycle is uh, verse 5 through 7. He, as he's going to uh, Philistine country to marry this woman, it says that uh, Samson went down with his father and mother. So he is walking with the righteous, yet we see something interesting. It says that uh, now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mighty upon him, and he tore the lion apart. How do you do that without coming in contact with the dead? and breaking your vows there, Nazarite. He is now breaking his covenant with God. He's living in sin. Why did that happen? Where were his family? It says this. It says, but he did not tell his father and mother what he had done. But he said he was going with him. He's not walking with the righteous. He's walking by himself, out on his own. Let the righteous do their thing. I'll do my thing. And then he tried to keep his sin a secret rather than going through the ritual, shaving his head and proclaiming, Lord, I have failed you. I repent. Let's start over. He hides it. He thinks he can handle it on his own. Men, we can't handle it on our own. The first observation about man going back to creation was it is not good for man to be alone. Yet that's so often where we try to retreat to. We try to hide our sins, and our failures, our brokenness in ourselves, so that on the outside we look strong like Samson, where on the inside we're destroyed. It's not good for man to be alone. Staying on the path of the righteous will keep you from the trap of sin. If he had been with the righteous, the lion wouldn't have been there. And he wouldn't have broke his vow. Well, what if the lion attacked the group of three of them? His dad's there. Well, but his dad's not strong. Is the same spirit not able to give to whom he wants when he wants? At any moment, God could have given his spirit over the father for the strength. See, the strength wasn't in Samson's hair. It was in the Holy Spirit. The spirit moved in him. Yet he tried to do it on his own. See, the, the enemy's trick for us in our sin is to try to make us isolate and keep it to ourselves. And if he can do that, he can destroy us. James says that we have to confess our, our sins, uh, and, and through con the confession of our sins, then we can receive healing. Therefore, if we do not confess our sins, we cannot receive healing. Those of you who need healing need to be willing to walk hand in hand with the righteous, sharing the burdens with them, not so they can fix you, but so that God can fix you. So that you can rely on Him to work in you. Some of us try to walk away from the righteous uh, out of this shame or embarrassment or even this rebellion. Well, yeah, i got to be raw. I, I cuss like the world. I, I do like the world. I get drunk like the world. I, do this. I want them to see that not all Christians are that way. My question to you would be, if that's you and you're isolating yourself by living the way of the world, are you really living the way of God? You may have the same... God, but there's a difference in are you serving him or not, because there are certain things he says to do and not to do. You've got to stay on the path of the righteous rather than trying to walk the path of the unrighteous while claiming to know the right way. And uh, so breaking this is get, get connected with other believers, get connected with other men, get in church. 
I look around on Sunday morning. I'm here in first service, so maybe, th maybe that's an unfair assessment. I'd say there's at least four girls for every man in that room. Men have become absent in the, in the church. And I think it's not because we are have ill intentions. I think it's because of the brokenness in us and we don't want anybody to magnify that brokenness because what if somebody sees? My, my answer to that would be everybody should see though, so that they can see how a healer can come in and heal them as well. The body needs men. Godly men following righteousness, following the paths that God had planned. And in the meanwhile, you're keeping from the trap of sin. Compromise, the third one, in 8 through 9. Uh, Samson ends up going back over. It says that uh, uh, after some time when he returns to get his wife, he strayed aside to see the carcass of the lion. So first he happened upon sin. Now he goes out of his way to sin. Isn't that the way sin grows? See, as, as men, we end up having this question in our, our minds, did I really win there? I want to see if I went, well, I, I made it that time, maybe I can make it again. Or I didn't make it that time, let's see if I'm man enough to do it this time. Yeah, every time I hang out with these guys, I, I end up going the wrong way, but hey, maybe I'm strong enough to be the, the one in, in the room that's not doing the same thing. Maybe I'll be the one that's hanging out with those friends. And, and we end up getting these, these distortions where we start being like the Jews, compromising and living next to sin, saying, well, it's not that bad as long as they're killing their own rather than mine. He goes out of his way and sees the carcass. When you go off the path once, you'll always have a pull to go back and revisit the very thing that destroyed your innocence with Christ. See, he goes back and visits, but see, sin never stays. Uh, he uh, sin never stays small and innocent. Our disgusting acts will grow until we seek to be nourished from death. He goes to the lion and reaches in the carcass. He not only looks at it, he's touching it to pull out honey in which he ate as nourishment. <laughs> he goes back to us. Well, this takes the edge off. This removes my stress. What if God intends your stress and is allowing you to be stressed so that you can rely on him to heal you and carry you through the stress so the world sees that you are drawing from a different well rather than the same one claiming a different God? Maybe God is allowing you to be in those hard circumstances so that the world around you can see there's hope outside of the bottle and the needle and the smoke and the beds the greed, the gluttony. Maybe he's allowing that to happen so that you can draw closer to him so he can have a deeper relationship with you than you've ever imagined. See, to break the cycle here, well, side note, Samson then takes that nourishment to his family and they eat of his sin. Your sin doesn't ever just affect you even if you keep it hidden. No matter how hidden you keep it, it still will overlap into the lives of those who are dearest to you. And some of you guys know that firsthand. Don't listen to the enemy about it's just you. But see, to break the cycle here, you must feed yourself until you are full. If you're full, you don't want to eat the junk food. If you are living a full life in Him... Whenever the snake comes with his empty fruits, you can walk away. I, I was told whenever I was dieting that the number one key to dieting and losing weight is plan your meals ahead of time. Because when you don't, you're in a hurry and you just go to the, the fridge and grab the junk food, the Twinkies out of the cupboard, or, or go to McDonald's or, or Burger King. Nobody goes to Burger King. Uh, or to Rosa's. To, and, and you start eating things that you know you shouldn't have passed where you should have stopped. What's the key to it? Eating healthily to start with. Men, we got to eat healthy regularly. If you're just eating Bill's sermons on Sundays and Wednesdays, you're starving yourself five days a week and expecting to be strong and not fall. Eat every day for yourself, not from somebody else, for yourself. There's a difference in getting spoon-fed twice a week 
and going out and grabbing the ribeye for yourself. Make some standards and blockades in your life. Sometimes you have to do that because you've journeyed from the path and you'll go back. Make, make some blockades in your life. Uh, there's, uh, there's times in, in your life where you will have to do, as Matthew says, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Friendships may need severed. Jobs may need left. There might be parts of our city that need alt control delete, removed. There is a, and I'm, I'm not away from this myself, there is a town here in Texas that is not on my map. I will drive an hour and a half out of my way to go around that town. Well, that's inconvenient and stupid. You must be weak. Yes, yes, and yes. It's inconvenient, and I wouldn't have to do it if I wasn't stupid to start with. And so, yes, I'm weak. But you know what? By driving around that town, I never reach in the carcass that before was just touched. See, sin begot sin, as righteousness begets righteousness. The seed you sow will grow. And the harvest will come. There's certain fields you need to avoid because you've planted bad seed. There's certain relationships, friendships, locations, situations that need removed completely. And might you look a little different? Might people judge you for it? Yeah. But isn't it worth it? I'd much rather not have an eye and look a little silly and get to heaven and have two beautiful eyes burning in the pits of hell. Foolishness, the fourth one here, and I'm going to end up picking up a little bit of speed here due to time. We've got uh, nine to cover. So four, foolishness. Yes, foolishness is a sin. I looked that up in New Testament. Uh, foolishness is sin. So this, this is our next one in our, our line, verse 10 through 20. He starts hanging out with the, the, the party at the wedding. And, well, hey, I, I'll, let's do this riddle. And they start doing this, this senseless, stupid stuff of, well, if you, if you get the riddle, you get all this stuff. If I get the riddle, you get all this stuff. And it's arguable whether or not he was drinking at this party. Regardless, he's acting like a blooming drunk. He's being foolish. So whether he kept his vows here or not, that's beside the point. We'll shelf that. The point is he's being foolish. And due to his foolishness, it leads his path down a different direction. Who you hang out with determines the next steps of your life. He hangs out with these guys, and the very next paragraph he loses, and he goes down to this village and murders this village of people who never even messed with Samson. Brutally murders them. Am I saying if you hang out with the wrong people, you're going to be a murderer? Well, maybe. Either way, you're killing part of yourself and your witness in the lives of those around you. So, yeah, sure, maybe you are being a murderer. Either way, the company you keep is either going to corrupt your character or it's going to build it. You might need, need to break this sin cycle by editing your friend list. Well, what if I hurt their feelings? Okay. But I really want to reach them for God. Let somebody else reach them for God if it's to the point that it's dragging you away from God. Trust that he's sovereign over that. Maybe one day he'll even let you overlap. But if you've already blown your witness to the point it can't, uh, be saved without you falling back into the pits of your addictions and sins? You've got a problem. Watch the company you keep. Uh, the, the next one, number five, is trusting a false god. Now, this one's a little confusing, so I'll, I'll explain this. Uh, he trusted the goddess of his passion rather than the true God. See, in verse 10 through 20 of chapter 14, 10 through 20, you see his wife pleading with him, tell me the riddle, tell me the riddle, please. He'll be okay. You can trust me. And she's begging. And so he trusts the goddess of his passions rather than the one true God. He ends up giving in to her wants rather than God's commands. 
There are times where the sin around you will be pleading with you. You'll get the itch to just one more time, one more hit, one more affair, one, one more time on, on, on that website or that app or just one more conversation with that, that woman or one, one more flirt, one more. And uh, you know what? I'm done smoking, but I'll keep that one more cigarette in the jar on the bookshelf. And the whole while, it's right there, nagging, begging, pleading. It's not that bad. It's just one. It's just one. It's not that bad. Please, just come back to us, your friends. Please, you used to be the life of the party. Please, we had such a friendship. Please, our relationship was so good. Please. Please bite the apple. Please betray your God and put me on the throne of your heart is really what the plea is. It's a one-seated throne. Don't put the wrong one there, even for a moment, or you're in the trap of sin. Don't trust even the most passionate, the way we break this, don't trust even the most passionate pleas from the enemy. Instead, follow the convictions of God. There are times where he will convict you and show you things. Run to those things. Uh, the next one, we're moving on to chapter 15, hate. Uh, in chapter 15, we, we see the sin of hate. Uh, one, verse 1 through 11, we end up running into this. Uh, the time of the harvest, Samson visited his wife, and, and uh, she was given away. Um, and so he ends up, uh, he says, uh, This time I shall be blameless regarding the, the Philistines if I harm them. And so he, he catches the foxes and lights them on fire and burns all their food so the villages are starving. Well, then, fast forward a little bit. They, the Philistines said, who has done this? Samson, son-in-law of the Timnite. So the Philistines came up and burned Samson's wife with her father, which, by the way, side note, that's what she was afraid of to begin with, was being burned. But see, when you follow the enemy, the very things that you are the most scared of are the very things that will destroy you. The loneliness, the emptiness, the brokenness. Be sure you're retreating to the right king. So, burn, and Samson said, since you would do a thing like this, I will take revenge on you, and after that I'll cease. Well, then uh, we end up having this great slaughter, again, breaking the vows. Uh, then he goes up and hides in this cleft of a rock, and, and then the Philistines went up to Judah, and they, they start attacking them. And, and uh, in verse 10, we have come to arrest Samson, do to him as he did to us. And then they go to Samson and say, what are you doing? And Samson says to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. Cycle. Hate grows hate. Hurt grows hurt. To break this cycle, see, uh, what we have is vengeance should be the Lord's. we got to leave room for Him, or we're saying that we know better, are stronger than, and can do better than God Himself. And so we're trying to take over the circumstances which we can never truly control, allowing somebody else to do likewise back unto us. Human revenge never settles issue, but rather escalates them. So to break the cycle here on hate, we have to forgive. I think of Jesus on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Don't you think those guys knew they were nailing him to a cross? Don't you think they knew they were murdering him, tearing him apart and torturing him slowly? Don't you think that coworker, that friend, that significant other knew what they were doing? My answer would be this, maybe not, because they're so deceived by the enemy, they're blind and can't see right from wrong and are just trying to survive. And you're caught in the crosshairs. By forgiving, you allow God room to move and to heal and to do something that you couldn't imagine. Next one is uh, verse 14 through 20. At this point, he picks up the jawbone, he, he whoops down, he gets this pride. He says, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps on heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've slain a thousand men. This is verse 16. And then when he finished speaking, he threw the jawbone down and he became very thirsty. Notice how he cries out to the Lord, you've given this great deliverance by my hand. By the way, something popped out to me in this story when I taught it to the youth that had never stuck out to me before. Samson's hands were tied. Well, he, he broke the... No, 
Read it again. Samson never broke those ropes. It says they melted like flax. God broke the ropes. The Spirit fell on Samson and God broke the ropes. Samson didn't do anything. God did it. Yet yeah, Samson, look at my hands! He starts betraying this pride to hide his brokenness, realizing that he's hopeless without the Lord, yet demanding that the Lord does what he wants when he wants. And so he demands this water, but isn't God gracious? God delivered him there from the ropes and then delivers him water. And Samson never thanked God or gave him credit. See, this pride uh, snuck in. Pride comes in many practices, uh, packages. He ultimately thinks he did all of it, but it was the Spirit that gave him strength. So often we think that we are, are the ones that are providing for our families, the ones that are protecting our families, the ones that are, that are doing our job, the ones that are uh, in charge of witnessing to those around us, the, the beacons of all human perfection or not. And we start trying to fill a role that was never ours to fill. We tried to sit on a throne that was God's to begin with, yet claim that it was us that filled it. So to break this, to kill this cycle, you have to recognize who the true victor and the true provider is and give credit and thanks to him. The next one here, it, now we're in the last chapter of Samson's life, sexual sin. Verse 1 through 3, we see Samson in bed with some prostitutes. It was a trap. And Samson, um, he, he ends up breaking the gates and running away with the gates on his shoulder and goes up on the mountain. But I, I tell you this, this sin right here is probably one of the most accessible traps in our day and age. It's, a, it's accessible and acceptable by those peers around us. There's apps, there's websites that uh, so often this isn't our cell phone first, it's our pocket porn first and our cell phone second. The, the way we talk with our friends, the relationships that we seek, we end up in all of these issues because we never gave God this part of the throne and thought we could keep that one for ourselves. Thinking that God's holding out on us and there's something better in those than in Him. See, sexual sin is one of the most accessible traps. Yet, in this we see Samson couldn't even escape this one. He was caught and destroyed. But I thought you said he grabbed the gates. and No, he was destroyed inside. He may have fled the physical, but the spiritual was crushed. You see... As with the lion where you start, it's going to grow until all, the, all that you hear is the voice of your passion rather than the voice of your loving father. Later in this chapter, he's not just sleeping with prostitutes. Now he's living in a committed relationship, living in a commitment to sin outside of the confines of marriage, outside of the confines of what God said of equally yoked. <coughs> The sin you practice, eventually you're not just going to play it, you're going to live it. See, this crushed him. He left feeling like a failure knowing he had been caught. Supposed to be God's pillar of righteousness, caught in his sin. This will begin to eat at every relationship you have. To break this one, flee from it, rebuke it. Remove the situations. Maybe you need to go to an old school flip phone. Isn't it better for you to look a little silly and a little different with one eyeball? So then the next one in uh, verse, uh, chap ch uh, the ninth one in chapter 16 is living outside God's calling. In verse 4 through 6, now we see him living with Delilah. He's living outside of God's calling. And, and she betrays him time and time again. Well, why did he keep telling her the, the, about his hair? She's like, well, that gives you your strength. By the way, it was never his hair that gave him his strength. I never saw that once in this story. I saw that the Spirit moved on him, and that's where his strength came from. Yeah, he thought it was the physical. He should have cut his hair a long time ago to follow his vow. 
His hair was his beacon of pride rather than his beacon of purity. So, so he starts living outside God's calling and, and compromise after compromise with Delilah. Sin will make you stupid and will gradually destroy you. You'll make dumb decisions looking back over your life. Some of you guys are like, yep, I've got lists. Yet in the moment, we think it's different. It's no different. Sin is sin, and it's been sin since the beginning of sin. God will never change, nor will sin. Flee from it. So to break this, to break this, uh, well, I do want to look at this, verse 20. In verse 20, it says this, the Spirit left him, and he didn't even realize it. See, when you get distant from God thinking you know Him, very soon you'll, you'll believe anything. You'll make compromise after compromise, and He finally reflect, reflects physically where He's been living spiritually. His eyes are gouged out. He's blind. He's weak as a lamb. He's finally now physically what He's been spiritually since, since chapter 13. In verse 20, He doesn't even know where God is anymore. That, that might be some of us in this room. Where are you, God? You think he's there because you know who he is, but you're living so far outside his will for your life that he's departed from you. And you're getting torn apart, mutilated by the enemy, mocked and scoffed. The key to breaking this cycle is walk in the Spirit daily. Now, these, these steps might sound intimidating and hard, and if you try on your own, you're going to fail for sure. Some of you guys are, well, I'm already a failure. Thank you for reminding me that. That's not the point. It gets better. See, I want you to see something here. Verse 28. Verse 28 is a key verse, in, in my opinion, all of Judges. In verse 28, Samson called to the Lord, saying, Oh, Lord God, remember me, I pray. See, now he's not talking about God as the God of Israel or God do this for me because I might as well be a God. Now he's saying, oh Lord, he's humbly repenting and approaching the throne of mercy and grace. And at this point, no matter how far you've fallen or how broken you are or have been, God still has a plan and a calling for you and will redeem you and your story. See, Samson's the last judge, and the reason I think he is is because he gets closer than any other judge up to this point to showing us the face of Jesus Christ. You see, Samson, Samson, completely broken, he goes up and he spreads his arms against those pillars and the house falls and the enemy is gone. It's a story of redemption of God's people. You see, his story may not look the way we thought it should have. Your story might not look the way you thought it should have. But rather than looking back on should-haves and would-bes and could-bes, what if we just walk in faithfulness towards what he wants and show Jesus? See, when man spread his arms here, the guilty fell dead in their sin and their trespass. But see, when Jesus spreads his arms in our lives, the guilty rise up in his righteousness. That's the story of the cross. Jesus was spread for our freedom from oppression, not so we could fall dead like we deserve, but so we could be raised in a life that we could never earn. You see, Samson is the story of God's mercy and his righteousness. Let God's redemption mercy break your sin cycle and allow Him to uh, use you for His purpose. And it starts with verse 28 in your life. A, a, a moment of redemption through, through, through uh, confessing your sins, through repentance, through humbly following God in His plan, even if it means the destruction of what you think you should have. I want to thank you guys for your time going through this. I hope we saw Samson a little different than we've seen before. And I, I do want to say this. If, if, you, if you got something from this, I want to highly encourage you. We record everything around here. Uh, ev everything always is recorded. It's like candid camera. Um, go on her website. The way I taught in here today is the same exact way I teach the youth kids. Because if I put the bar here, the kids can get here. If I put the bar here, what am I giving them? Scraps? 
If you got something from today, there are nine lessons. I breezed through Samson. There's nine weeks. I intended two at the start of Samson because I didn't care for the fool, and then I realized I'm the fool. There's nine lessons through the life of Samson. It's in the, the Judges series on, on the youth tab. And if that blesses you, and I, listen to the other 35 weeks of Judges. Uh, it, it transformed me completely. Not through the stories, but through the stories pointing me back to Jesus, who can heal you and change you, no matter where you are. Uh, Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you that we could see how to break the sin cycle, not in and of ourselves, but only through you and your son. And I just ask that, yes, we take these uh, little, little nuggets of wisdom and plug them into our lives. But ultimately, if we don't repent and chase after you and your purpose, it's all for naught. So I just ask God that both of those would come together in our lives so that we could be married not to the world or to compromise or to not that bad, but we could be married to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys.